Hello, good morning. Good morning. Why don't you come on in and have a seat? It is great to see everyone this morning. Welcome to Freedom Church. Come on in, find a seat. Welcome, welcome. There are plenty of seats around. Find your favorite seat. Sit near your favorite people. That's the joy of this. Great to see you all. Welcome to everyone online as well. Thank you for joining us. Is everyone feeling comfortable? Is everyone feeling chatty? You can tell it's a bank holiday weekend, can't you? It's like 10.36 and we're like, shall we start church? Yeah, let's start church. But you don't want to start church because you're already in church because it's not about the service, it's about the people. Am I right? So church started even before you walked in the building. And that is the joy of being here this morning. It is great to have you. Thank you for coming. Um, We're going to spend some time worshipping Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so whatever you're feeling right now, uh, maybe you've had a good week, maybe you've had a rubbish week. Um, This is a bit of a reset moment, isn't it, always, when we gather together and together we fix our eyes heavenward and we just give everything over to God. That's what worship is. We acknowledge who he is above, above it all. And then we remind ourselves that he is in control and that we are with him and he is with us. So why don't you stand to your feet and let's pray. And then let's get into it this morning. Give yourself a moment. Allow your mind, your heart, your soul, your spirit just to raise above the circumstances of life right now. Jesus, we are so thankful for you. And Lord, we know you are here amongst us, God. And Father, in this space, we give you glory, we give you praise above the chaos and confusion of life. We just acknowledge you in this moment. We want to lift you high. We're here for you. We are gathered here for you. And so as we worship you, I pray, God, that this wouldn't, this wouldn't be a moment for the sake of it, Lord, but it would be this moment where our hearts just connect with who you are and what you're doing in this place. Lord, we're believing for miracles this morning. We're believing for breakthrough. We're believing to leave here encouraged, equipped, Lord. We're believing for turnarounds in situations that don't seem to be shifting. Lord, we're expectant this morning. We are expectant for you to move. So we worship you now. We give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Let's go, Phil. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Let's worship.
Here's a reminder of the chorus. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out. was we worship the god who is we worship the god who evermore will be he opened the prison doors he parted the raging sea our god he holds the victory there's joy in the house of the lord there's joy in the house of the lord today we won't be quiet Of the Lord today, and 
Father, there, are, there is no one, there is nothing uh, better than you. And God, in this moment, we just want to realign our priorities, Lord, where we've been living. Perhaps in a way where we've been putting other worries or anxieties or things above you in our life, God, in this moment, we remind ourselves of the reality. Lord, that you are number one. There is nothing better than you. There is nothing higher than you. You have all authority and power, and this is why we worship you. Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Guys, have a seat. As I said at the start, thank you so much for being here this morning. We love having you here. This is an incredible sort of light show going on down to my left, which is adding to the whole atmosphere in this room. I think the big question in May is, are there any days that aren't ban bank holidays? Um, which is an absolute joy, isn't it? Um, bank holidays pretty much every week. Um, so we want to make the most of it, of course. Um, next Sunday is the 7th of May. Um, which I believe is Freedom Church's birthday. Pretty much. It's pretty much Freedom Church's birthday. Um, well done to Freedom Church. Um, I don't know who we're capping, us, I don't, but well, well done, us. Um, 14? 14 years of Freedom Church next Sunday. Uh, Monday, the 8th of May, um, is, I think, one of the, um, I'll put it this way, one of the crowning moments of our generation, um, put it that. Um, it is, of course, my birthday um, <laughs> next Monday. Um, no, no, next Monday. Um, but, uh, no, I'm joking. Well, I'm not joking, it's my birthday. Uh, but it's also the King's coronation on Monday the 8th. Um, so on Sunday the 7th, next Sunday, um, if the weather's good, and, I mean, it's not been the spring we wanted yet so far, has it? Um, if the weather's good, we're thinking of doing like a bit of a church picnic um, after the service. So if you do have an extra couple of hours when church finishes... And depending on how good the weather is, if it's like cloudy, we might just go across the road to the park. But if it's going to be a stormer, um, like a, a stormer is in really sunny, not, I'm confusing everyone here this morning. This is the worst notices um, for some time. Um, if it's really sunny, we might choose a beach and go there and then just say, hey, we're going to this beach and you can jump in the car and bring some food. So yeah, put it in your diary. If you fancy it, next Sunday, we're going to try and hang out um, after church, which is going to be great. Next Sunday as well um, will be the first of two, Tim mentioned this last week, we're going to have a couple of gift day Sundays. Um, obviously, every time you come in here at the moment, there is something new that's been done. And it is just an incredible space, isn't it? I still haven't got over every time I walk in. It's just looking beautiful in here. There are still quite a lot of bits and bobs that need doing. And so on the 7th and the 14th, we're just going to take a little bit of time in both of those services. Um, firstly, to update you as to where we're at and what's going on but also as well to just encourage all of us to prayerfully consider um, what it would look like to contribute to finishing this thing off. Um, and I'm really excited for those two, um, two weeks coming up. And so you'll hear more about that next Sunday, but just so you know um, that it's coming. So that's the 7th of May. The other big thing in May, which I think is probably worth putting in your diaries, um, is Friday, the 19th of May, we are going to have our second filling station evening. Now, who was at the first filling station a few weeks ago? Like a lot of people. It was a powerful night, right? It was, what, what, for those that don't know, the filling station is we basically give over a Friday night. We believe that God is actually doing something really powerful at the moment, not just here in Jersey, but we're seeing the bubblings of it all across the UK and even over in America and across different parts of the world. And we want to lean into that. We don't want to miss what God is doing. We want to pursue his heart for our generation. And so that's what the filling station is all about. There's no agenda to those nights. We just, we have a worship team up here and we just lean in to worship and prayer for an evening. And we believe that we're going to hear God speak into us, through us, and just do something powerful. And we also, we're sensing this building of momentum as well. We have our intercession um, nights that we do every other Wednesday. So not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. Um, God's doing something through prayer and worship at the moment. And if you're interested in that and you want to push a little bit deeper, um, then put Friday the 19th into your diary, um, and we're just going to gather again and pray and believe that God's going to do something uh, really powerful. So we're excited for that night, really excited for it. Um, so lots coming up in May. 
Um, I'm also excited about today and the rest of today's service. So over this weekend, um, LICC, which stands for the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, have been in town. They've been in Jersey. They've been doing a number of events. Um, they did some stuff for church leaders on Friday morning. Um, they had an envisioning visioning night last Friday night um, at St. Paul's Centre as well, which I know quite a few of you went to. Um, and we're really glad to have LICC um, in town for these few days. Um, LICC are really, their focus is whole life discipleship. And it's really helping um, each and every one of us understand what it looks like when we walk out of this church building Monday to Saturday. How can we make a difference for Jesus? How can we find Jesus in the mundane, in the workplace, in our families? What does that look like? This is LICC's mission. They resource, they equip, they empower, they encourage churches and people like us um, to step out of our comfort zones, but also to see every part of life as a space where God can do something. And um, I think the reason you can probably guess that I'm happy to have them here is it feels like there's a real alignment to everything that we've been speaking about for the last year. We did our whole Reimagining Church series last year where we talked about actually what does it mean to be the church? We really value the gathered. We really value the scattered. What does it look like day to day to be part of the church? And this is very much in alignment with who LICC are. Um, and we're privileged to have Paul Woolley, who is the CEO of LICC, with us this morning, who's going to share with us. Um, Paul was, uh, before LICC, was the Deputy Chief Executive at Bible Society, so he's been over to Jersey a number of times in both capacities. Um, but it's great to have him here this morning. I think it's going to be a really powerful, practical, encouraging message. So I'm going to encourage all of you to lean in. And for that reason, we're keeping the youth um, in today, because I think this is going to be really applicable for you guys as well. So um, if you guys stay in the service, um, but for kids, you've got your usual um, kids ministry is going to be going on all around the building. So um, we're going to release you guys, um, children head out, young people stay in, um, and for everyone else, turn around, say hi to someone, and the next voice you hear will be Paul's.
Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you this morning. Thank you so much for your welcome. It's really good to be back in Jersey. I spent yesterday afternoon at the boat show. It was such a struggle to choose. <laughs> I understand that you have been working through the five acts of the drama of Scripture, which is amazing. These acts of creation and fall and Israel and Jesus and church, and that you're in between Jesus and church, which is a great place to be. And it seems appropriate, therefore, to start with two Bible readings, one from the Gospels and one from one of Paul's letters. So let me read firstly from Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And then Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, the Apostle Paul wrote, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Lord, please fill us with your spirit and speak to us through your word. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me tell you a little bit about LICC, although Ben did a brilliant job. That was a brilliant plug. Thank you, Ben. The initial stand for the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, which is a little bit of a mouthful, and we were set up by John Stott back in 1982 in order to equip Christians to relate the gospel to all of life and engage with the modern world. And that remains our focus today. I'm married to Ruth, and we have four children. Here they are. They'll appear on the slide. Amos, who is age 12, Atticus is 10, Esther is 6, and Otis is just 3. The first three were born on the 23rd of September, October, and November, respectively, which is really useful. Unfortunately, Otis didn't read the briefing note and he decided to come a little bit earlier. But that's the four children and Ruth, that's the six of us. And incidentally, I drove past this sign on the way to Bristol Airport, <laughs> which I think is excellent advice. <laughs> I commend it to you. We live in Wiltshire, just 10 minutes off Junction 15 on the M4, south of Swindon, and we live there because that's where Bible Society's HQ is based, where I worked for 10 years prior to joining LICC. But Swindon isn't just HQ to Bible Society. It's also the birthplace of the NHS. It is the site of Brunel's great railway works, and it's also the home of the world's first lending library. If you knew nothing about Swindon before, there are three facts for you to go away with. It's also statistically the most average place to live in the UK across every demographic, I kid you not. Uh, in fact, Waitrose have opened up a concept store in Swindon. Clearly, it was very exciting when Waitrose did arrive in Swindon. But the idea of this concept store is that if something sells in Swindon, it's going to sell everywhere else. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? Here's another. If we 
claim to be Christian, wrote John Stott, we must be like Christ. If we claim to be Christian, we must be like Christ. Jesus describes his followers, his disciples, his students, his apprentices as being the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world, but by extension, so are those who follow him. The Apostle Paul, perhaps reflecting on those words from Jesus, exhorts his readers to shine like stars in the night sky. We're to shine the light of Jesus. We're not to be like a lamp that's put under a bowl. That's such a ridiculous idea, isn't it? We're not to be like that. Instead, we are to allow the light of Jesus to shine out of us so that people might see it. We're not to be like a town or a village tucked away in a valley whose lights are concealed from view. But we're to be like a city on a hill that can't be hidden and whose lights are clearly seen for miles around. But we have a problem. And the problem is this. 98% of Christians don't feel equipped to shine like stars or live as disciples of Jesus in 95% of their waking lives. That's what we discovered at LICC. That's a staggering statistic, isn't it? The red dots on this slide represent Christians here in Jersey. That's a bit about 6,000 people. On the left of this slide, we see these Christians gathered like this on a Sunday, or it could be a Wednesday evening. On the right-hand side, we see the same Christians, but this time scattered in the different spaces and places they live and work and show up. But here's the thing. It's often easier to sing a little louder on a Sunday than to live a little bolder every other day of the week, isn't it? It's difficult being a disciple. It's tempting to think of life being like an orange. We can think of it as being divided into self-contained separate segments, some of which are important to God. The segments like prayer, and corporate worship, and Bible reading, and other church-based activities, but other parts of life, other segments in that orange aren't important to God. It's tempting to think like that. Segments like work, and school, and study, and leisure, and entertainment. But that's not the way God made us or sees us. Life's more like a peach than an orange. It's a single, non-compartmentalized fruit with God at the core where all of life is important to God. Yes? Life's like a peach, not an orange. It can be a challenge to live as a disciple of Jesus, though, can't it? It can be a challenge to live publicly as a disciple of Jesus. We can struggle to be the light to the world. We can struggle to shine like stars in the night sky. It was also a challenge for the earliest Christians. That's certainly what we discover as we work through the pages of the New Testament. The Christians at Philippi struggled to relate the gospel to their everyday lives and work. They were living in a pagan culture unsure of themselves, afraid of being associated publicly with Jesus. They lacked 
confidence. So Paul reminds them that their public behavior, their life in the city, it needs to reflect the life of Jesus. They are to shine like stars in the night sky. Why? Because the world needs to see that there's a better way of being human. And that looks like Jesus. That's why we're to shine like stars in the sky. That's why we're to be the light of the world. If a house is dark, there's no sense in blaming the house. The question to ask is, where is the light? If society is dark, there is no sense in blaming society. The question to ask is, where is the church? Where is the light of Jesus? Friends, you are the light of Jesus. You are the light of of the world. You are stars that shine in the night sky. In the Christmas story, we read of people who discovered Jesus because they followed a star. Friends, that applies similarly today. But here's the really scary thing. We are the star we are the star. It is through us. It's through our life in the city. It's through our life in the everyday, the way we interact with people, the way we engage in conversation, the way we deal with the emails we send and the conversations we have and the things we write, that we reflect the life of Jesus. It's through us that the world sees Jesus. If we want to see the church revitalized and society changed, we need to help one another shine like stars in the sky every day of the week, not just Sundays. So what's the answer? How can we do that? How can we shine like stars in our everyday lives and in our work, in our neighborhoods, in our workspaces, our leisure spaces. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Philippi, tells the Christians there that they can be confident living as followers of Jesus, not because of the size of their faith, but because of who God is and what God has done in history what God has done in the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus and through the sending of the Spirit. That is the basis for our confidence. It's a really important point to get hold of, isn't it? It's not the size of their faith that's critical. It's because they're children of God that they can be confident about living publicly as disciples of Jesus. It's because they're children of God that they can shine like stars in the sky. And what was true of the church at Philippi is true of the church in Jersey. Paul talks about shining like stars as they cling on to the word of life. And who is the word of life? is Jesus. I am the way and the truth and the life, says Jesus. If we want to see who God is, we look at the person, the life of Jesus. If we want to see what life in all its fullness looks like, if we want to see what it is to be fully alive, we look at the life of Jesus. One of my all-time favorite quotes is from an ancient theologian called Irenaeus. This is what he said. The glory of God is seen in a human being fully alive. 
In other words, it's as we step into the life that Jesus calls us to, as we cling on to the word of life, Jesus, that we shine like stars, that we discover what it is to be fully alive. And as we do, God's glory is seen because that's how God has made us. That's God's purpose for us. It's as we cling, cling to Jesus, that we shine like stars in the sky. So what might this look like practically every day of the week, in school, at work, in our neighborhoods? We've developed a little framework at LICC, and it's called the 6M. Some of you might have come across it before. And I think it's a helpful way of helping us see how the light of Jesus is already shining through us, but also expanding our imaginations to see what God might do in and through us and the lives of others. These are the six M's, molding godly character is the first, making good work, ministering grace and love, molding culture, being a mouthpiece for truth and justice, being a messenger of the gospel. Six M's. Let me go through some of those in a bit of depth and some very briefly. The first M, modeling godly character. We can reflect the character of Jesus to those around us. Whatever we do, wherever we are, we're either reflecting God's character or we're not. In the process of following Jesus, God forms our character to be like Jesus, enabling us to better reflect his character to those around us. And as that happens, we become bearers of the fruit of the Spirit, of love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. What could that look like for you practically? Maybe it's displaying a cool head when someone you're serving is provoking you. Maybe it's bringing joy by encouraging those around you. What could it be for you? What has it been for you over this past week? This is Jess Kahn, who is a friend of mine. She is a physician associate at St. George's Hospital in London, and I was talking with her recently about how she lives as a disciple of Jesus in her work. She was talking with me about something that had happened just a few days earlier. She was uh, working, it was quite busy, and uh, on her ward, she then receives a call from a junior doctor who needs some information about a patient that he is uh, working with, um, treating, and uh, it's, it's relatively simple information to access, but it will make the world of difference to that junior doctor, the patient, and the patient's family. With the right information, that patient can be discharged. Whilst Jess is talking with that junior doctor, her senior colleague comes in, just grabs the phone and slams it down, and says, we can't be doing with that. We're just too busy. How does Jess model godly character? in that situation. She waits for her senior colleague to go out the room. She picks up the phone. She apologizes to the junior doctor, gives the information, and that enables the patient being treated to be discharged. It made a huge difference to a whole number of people that day. Jess told me that she's known as someone who brings love and joy and kindness into work. She said, new colleagues often say, I've heard about you, you're good to work with, and bring the mood up. Isn't that extraordinary? It's so simple, isn't it? But it's revolutionary. That's how organizations are transformed. Imagine if every Christian 
on Jersey was known as someone who was a joy to work with because they raised the mood. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that start off a revolution? I don't know if uh, this person is familiar to any of you. Give me an indication if you know who he is. There's no reason why you should. This is Stanley Harvas. He is a theologian and an ethicist, and he is on record for giving probably the shortest ever address at the University of Aberdeen. It was a graduation address, and uh, it's so short that I've been able to memorize it, and I'm going to give it to you now. This was the address that Stanley Harvas gave. Do not lie. That's it. Do not lie. Imagine if every Christian on Jersey told the truth, didn't lie. Would that not change everything? That wouldn't just change Jersey, it would change the British Isles, it would change the world. Do not lie. So tempting, isn't it, to be economical with the truth, basically, to lie. I've never known any church underestimate the number of people doing the Alpha course. So easy. I do it myself. I, why do I round up the numbers? So subtle. Do not lie. Tell the truth. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. The second M is making good work. This means knowing that everything that we do is for the glory of God. This time tomorrow matters as much in God's economy as now. Do you believe that? This time tomorrow matters to God as much as this time now. We can do everything, the fun, the interesting, the big, the small, the mundane, and the just plain boring for the glory of God and the life of the world. This is a picture. I was about to say photograph. It's not a photograph. It's Bro Brother Lawrence, 1640. And he joined a Carmelite priory in Paris at the age of just 26. He was assigned to the monastery kitchen, and for a number of years he struggled to understand how his work mattered to God. But it was in the mundane daily reality of cooking and cleaning and chopping and scrubbing that he discovered that his work mattered to God, that it was an act of worship. And that realization was not only a source of healing and peace for Lawrence, but the source of healing and peace to generations of Christians around the world. One of the first jobs I had was working in the House of Commons. I was working as a researcher to a member of parliament, and that involved a whole range of things. I drafted letters and speeches and articles. I attended meetings. I answered the telephone every Wednesday I would go into the chamber of the House of Commons to watch Prime Minister's Question Time. It was amazing. It was at the time when Tony Blair was Prime Minister, William Hague was leader of the opposition, and they would have this banter, this debate, this Prime Minister's Question Time every week. I mean, it had absolutely no impact or relevance to everything that was going on in the world, but it was great entertainment. I loved it. I loved that job. But I also had to do a lot of filing a lot of photocopying, and I made an awful lot of tea. And if I'm completely honest with you, I slightly resented that. Imagine the difference it would have made if I had understood that what I was doing was for the glory of God and the life of others. It would have changed everything. It wouldn't have just changed me it would have changed something in the room. It would have had an impact on those 
that I was working with and seeking to serve. If we stack shelves or clean carpets or mark books, if we process invoices, if we study for our exams, or if we perform surgery for the glory of God, it changes everything. Do we believe that? The third M in this framework is ministering grace and love. This could be as simple as a timely cup of coffee or taking 10 minutes out of your day to talk stuff over with someone who's struggling. When have you ministered grace and love in the last week? I know you have. I know you have. The fourth M is molding culture. Culture just means the way we do things around here. We can shape the culture of the places in which we live and work by making just small changes, as well as big changes that reflect something of the life of Jesus. Shaping culture might involve quenching gossip with a positive word for the person who's always the butt of other people's jokes. When have you molded culture? I heard a brilliant example of this over the last few weeks. It involves a newly qualified teacher. This NQT starts off at her new school, and she notices within the first few days that the atmosphere of the school is toxic. Worse, she notices that the atmosphere in the staff room is utterly toxic. She can't work out what's going on. Why is there such resentment between the staff in the staff room? And then she works out what the issue is. Do you know what it was? It was the milk in the fridge. What happened is that all the teachers would get their milk, their little pints of milk. They'd take a black Sharpie pen and write their name on the side. They'd put it in the fridge for the week, and other people would use it. And this caused huge resentment. And it built this toxic environment. Do you know what this NQT does? This disciple of Jesus? Yeah. She starts her day by getting six pints of milk. She gets a black Sharpie pen and she writes for everyone on the side. She puts the milk into the fridge. And I am not joking, that single action has changed the atmosphere, not only of the staff room, but the whole school. Isn't that extraordinary? It's so simple, but it's so profound. It's so simple, but it's really life-changing. So the fifth M is about being a mouthpiece for truth and justice, whether we realize it or not, this is something we get to do every day could be as simple as speaking up for someone, a colleague perhaps, who's been overlooked. It could be not taking the credit that someone else deserves for a piece of work. Or it could be bigger, it could be ruling our patch, our business, our area of responsibility that God has given us and ruling it well, big or small. Being a mouthpiece of truth and justice looks like standing up, often at personal cost, to promote good, fair practice. This is Catherine. She's another friend of mine. She works for the Crown Prosecution Service in the area of communications. Catherine is deeply motivated by a God who is totally committed to putting the world to rights. But in the role that she has, how does she seek to be a mouthpiece for truth and justice? She does that by celebrating the contribution of others, making sure that those that are often on the margins and whose work takes place behind the scenes are applauded for some of the contribution that they make. Catherine's doing that intentionally as a disciple of Jesus. And it's making all the difference, not only to the lives of the people that she comes into contact with, but the culture of that organization as a whole. 
The sixth M, final M, is being a messenger of the gospel. Now, of course, all of this framework is about being a messenger of the gospel, shining the light of Jesus. But the 6M draws attention to the fact that we can talk with people about Jesus. God has called each one of us to be witnesses to the loving rule and resurrection life of Jesus. As you think about all aspects of your life, your time with family and friends, your work, your leisure activities? Where are you conscious of opportunities that you have to talk about Jesus? This is Massimo. He has been a general builder for 33 years. And he often sings whilst he's working. I recognize that's not appropriate for all of us in all our working contexts, but it's appropriate for Massimo. And one of his favorites is Who You Say I Am a child of God. And when he's singing, people often ask him about what he's singing and who he's singing about and the difference that that has made to his life. Massimo was telling me a few weeks ago about the situation he'd had with a client of his who was often swearing using Jesus' name. And Massimo found that difficult to do his work in that environment. And so he turned to his client and he said, would you mind just not doing that? And the client got very angry and said that he could do exactly what he wanted in his house. He had every right to say what he wanted to say. Do you know what Massimo said? He turned to him and he said, you are right, but Jesus loves you. He loves you. That client went on to be one of Massimo's best clients. And his life has been impacted by those words that Massimo spoke to him. We have an opportunity to talk about Jesus. We can do that as we cling to Jesus, the word of life. A number of years ago, a friend of mine was talking about a situation that they'd had. They were facing an incredibly difficult time in their life. They were at an absolute low point. They were in their front room, and they were praying that God would show up. Russell prayed, Lord, I need to know that you love me. Show up. I need to know that you're there. He gets his jacket on, he walks out the front door, he walks down to the tube station, and someone crosses the road and says, excuse me, I just need you to know that God loves you very much, and walks away. When I heard Russell tell me that, do you know what I thought? I thought a few things. Firstly, that is amazing. God answered Russell's prayer. Secondly, I thought, that is amazing. There was someone who God said, go and tell that man that I love them. And they had the guts, they had the courage to walk across the road and do that. And I thought, thirdly, that's not fair. Why doesn't that happen to me? And I prayed, God, you show me that you love me. I want you to show up. And I heard God say to me, Paul, You don't need me to do that for you right now. You know that I love you. I'm on a train a few weeks later, and I hear God saying to me, tell the person opposite that I love them very much. Do you know what I did? Absolutely nothing. I lacked the courage. I lacked the confidence. I wasn't comfortable being that visible, looking stupid. We have an opportunity to talk about Jesus, to offer people the words of life from the one we have experienced to be the one who gives life in all its fullness. All these six M's, they they work together 
They're all part of our witness to those around us of God's action in our everyday lives. And here's the thing. Hearing about a God of love becomes a lot more believable when you've seen the person who's sharing him with you act in a loving way. Yeah? A God of justice makes so much more sense when you've seen a follower of his stand up in the face of unfair practices. Let me, as we prepare to close, introduce you to Rich. Rich is a barista, and this is how he seeks to relate these six M's to his work as a barista. It's a short video. It's about um, one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you. Rich is a barista in an independent cafe. How does he blend the six M's of fruitfulness in his life? Well, for him, it's all about creating caring community and serving quality coffee. Every day, he gets the chance to model godly character. Peace when the early morning queue stretches outside the shop. Love for whoever comes through the door. Kindness for someone having a stressful day and maybe taking it out on him. Rich makes good work. He makes sure that each espresso shot is well extracted and balanced and ensures the milk is just the right texture and temperature. He ministers grace and love, not just getting to know customers' drinks, but finding shared interests to chat about. Sport, sport, sport with Dave, or films with Steve. He helps struggling people along, not banishing an angry regular who can't hold it together. This is their community coffee shop too, but he prays for them and asks friends to do the same. So Rich moulds the culture, makes this cafe a special place to come to and a special place to work. He's a mouthpiece for truth and justice, making sure his team don't overwork or get landed with endless extra hours without pay. And Rich gets to be a messenger of the gospel, trusting God that he's playing his part in God's saving purposes for every customer, ready to share lovingly as the Spirit leads. What does living the six M's of fruitfulness look like for you? Friends, you are the light of the world. Friends, you are stars that shine in the night sky. That is what God calls us to. And you need to be that. You need to be that for the sake of the world. You need to be that for the rest of the population on this island and further away still, who have yet to have any experience of the life that Jesus brings. We are bearers of this life, and Jesus calls us as we cling to him to share this life with others. As you leave today, there are various um, resources. There's some goodie bags in the little um, welcome area downstairs. Please help yourself to, to whatever you would like to take. Um, our hope and prayer is that within those bags, um, there are some tools that will help you as you seek to live this life every day of the week. Are you up for this? Would you stand? Could I pray for you, please? Let's pray. Lord, these are your people clinging to Jesus, shining like stars in the night sky. Would you draw others to know you through them? Would you stretch out your hand to do great works in the places and spaces they live and work and play? Would you give them courage? Would you give them the presence of mind to share the life of Jesus each day through their words and through their actions? Would you anoint these people as they seek to be radical 
disciples of Jesus. For your glory and for the life of this island and this world, we pray in Jesus' name. with this song that sings stir a passion stir a passion in my heart God. let it overflow let it overflow stir a passion in my heart God. let it overflow let it
that only you can bear no one else the weight of our sin our thoughts our, our actions Lord that are not good that set us way way far apart from you but Lord you brought us a, the cross that filled the gap your blood your body and you've made us a way and a future and a hope in you Lord and if that's you right now just encourage you so much to press into what he's doing for you. There's so many people that would love to pray with you or friends or if you don't know anybody in this church, I really want to pray for you. Because God is good and his love endures forever. He has a hope and a future for you. Maybe we could just sing that for us again. just mentioned um, as always we have our prayer ministry team around and about and they mainly will congregate at sort of that far um, edge of the auditorium back there so if anything that Paul or Amy has said has just resonated with you and you're like I just need someone to pray with me then don't miss this opportunity don't leave the room without getting someone to pray for you even if it's just turning and asking a friend and saying will you pray for me these are powerful moments I think everything that Paul has said today. The big question is, what does that mean for me? That's the thing to reflect on. That's the thing to take out of here. For this week, those six M's, what does that look like for you? And reflect on it and just do something. Start small, but just do something this week because you know that God is going to use you. I was so encouraged by that message. Can we thank um, Paul for, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. And thanks to you guys for coming as well. We're going to end the service there. But uh, stick around for a coffee, stick around for prayer. It's been great to have you here. Have a wonderful bank holiday tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.